Naresh, uh, members of the Zara group or friends for, um, of the Ghana Police Force, Chief Johnson, members of the NYPD, our own Force Welfare Officer, Sir, could you take us? Thank you, she's on holiday and learned about this during her holiday, find her way here. Um, members of the Ghanese diaspora, ladies and gentlemen, again, a very good night to you, and I am heartened by your turnout, despite of the fact that members of an association called the Ex-Police Association of Guyana uh, attempted to dissuade persons from coming here. The story is that I know a lot of senior officers who have retired from the Guyana Police Force and are living in New York at the moment. I have the greatest respects for them. I don't know that they were involved in that letter. Knowing them, I don't think they were. Um, that was a letter questioning who are friends of the Guyana Police Force and who are arranging this thing and whether they are uh, authorized to do so and the works. The thing is, the ex-police association does not represent the Guyana Police Force. The ex-police association is not authorized to raise any funds for any project of the Guyana Police Force without the authorization of the commissioner. And there is no such project occurring right now. As a matter of fact, there have been no contact between the association and the um, office of the commissioner for this year. Not one communication. And so I don't know uh, what motivated the letter. I think the chairman may have misguided himself. Um, we do need support and we do accept support from everyone. However, we don't accept support at the cost of our dignity. So we encourage if we are to work together, there must be some communication. And uh, we do, as I will show in the presentation later on, the, um, we do a lot of work, a lot of partnership work. So I wish also to recognize um, Dr. Carl Naimatali, came out of Guyana. Thank you, Dr. Some other friends, I want to recognize the efforts of uh, Naresh and his team, Dr. Jagopat, uh, Naresh's wife, Radhika, uh, Rhonda, uh, who else I don't remember. Thank you all very much for putting this together. Chantel is somewhere out there as well. <laughs> um, I know when, um, after we launched the foundation, that I was due to do something personal in New York. And also that I will be going to Mexico, uh, went there last week actually, and was scheduled to return home yesterday. I took two weeks off to do the personal thing for myself here and I made a call to Naresh for him to put together what he has done here, this excellent effort to raise funds for the foundation. The foundation only was launched two Thursdays ago uh, in Guyana. And um, I have a daughter living in, in um, a town called Melbourne in Florida. So I called another friend from Orlando and said maybe work with the diaspora so while I'm visiting my daughter we can do something there as well for the foundation. And then I'm leaving from Miami so I called some members of the diaspora and said let's do something in Miami before I go back home. So that's my two weeks vacation. Wow. <laughs> I, I like doing this and um, that is why I have um, no problem, I'm fully motivated, putting my efforts um, into these things. But in preparing for this, I know that I'm going to reach a Guyanese diaspora. And I also understand 
how interested you are about crime in Guyana, crime in particular, maybe several other interests, but also um, crime. And I will be failing if I come here and don't tell you a little bit about what we are doing in the police force to address that situation in Guyana. Now, um, I started to search for a point of de uh, departure. Where will it begin to address what we are doing? And so I decided that it might be useful for me to talk about when I took office. Because you can't go and blame, you know, everybody operating their own circumstances. And you can't lay blame on anyone. And also that the realities that I face, they may uh, not face the same realities. So that is why I chose to start here. There is no other reason. This is a statement, or an excerpt of a statement made by Commissioner Bramil, my um, immediate predecessor. So during his retirement speech, he said the honor and distinction of being an officer, male and female, is failing. No longer is an officer respected by society. No longer is he trusted. No longer is our uniform worn with pride. So from his view, that is where the police force was at that time. That was April last year. I wish to show you this. This is the Latin American public opinion polls. It's a survey that done um, within the Latin American Caribbean to see who are the public organizations that are trusted and who are not. This is Guyana. You see who is at the bottom there? The Guyana Police Force. This is data taken in 2013. This report was published last year. And this is a university, not in Guyana, it's a uh, university. This is what the same survey says about police forces in the region. Look right down at the bottom and you find the Guyana police force. So this was my reality. What do we do? We muster officers, senior officers, and we identified the issues that we had to deal with. We were 350 short of the establishment then, so we had to deal with recruitment, we had to deal with keeping the people in the force, keeping the officers in the force. We had to build capacity, so we had to resource and develop skills. We had to earn public trust, you see where we were. We had to improve morale within the force. We have to make these officers now feel proud to wear the uniform. Proud of who they are. And then we had um, the police strategic plan that was supposed to start the implementation in 2011. That until then, implementation hasn't started. What do we do? What we did complements each other. All the strategies that we deploy complement each other. So we started, um, and I'll talk a little bit more of this when I came out. This social crime prevention program that we started, um, see there? I'll explain why we do it, but we started with the Albystone project, which was launched two weeks after I took office. Um, we start a series of community projects all across the country. We were able to address recruitment to the stage where the colleges were filled, and there was a waiting list of applicants. It happened so quick that we look at the demands for human resources throughout the country. The interior was developing, there was this um, huge rise in price of gold, so a lot of investment went into mining and logging and so on, and a shift from the coastland into the interior. There was a big housing drive by the government then, 
And so there were new communities developing all over population shift. And so new demands for policing services. So we had to expand. We proposed to the government then an expansion of 1,500, which was accepted. So we had the 1,500 and we had 350 from the previous establishment to fill. Today, we are at par. We already recruited, trained, and deployed that 350. Our colleges are filled, and the waiting list of applicants is 1,200. By the end of next year, we will have 1,200 trained and deployed. We actually uh, went and modified the recruit training. is actually a residential training, so you live in. For the duration of that training, it was six months. We modified it four months to address the shortage in less time. Without um, uh, actually short changing the recruits, it's just that it, the training intensified a little bit more. The retention issues, well, this is one, but there have been several other things. Um, Dr. Caroline Matali now has a, a clinic at one of the police training centers in Ivlery that he does free of cost for all the senior officers. Um, the force welfare officer, we have the um, clinic in Brickdam, and they have started moving to the divisions. So all around the country we go, and then we not only treat police ranks when we go out there, we treat anyone in the community. Dr. Naimatali has spearheaded this issue, social prevention program, and the aspect of deal with medical care. One of the things we do there is um, life skills education. So we would go out, and they do presentation on lifestyle diseases and how everything is on your eating, your exercise, and so on, prevents those diseases. So we would have like 10, 15 doctors volunteering. We will go to the ministry, get me education, and we go into the rural areas and spend a day. A secure book post we went once, we uh, treat about um, 550 people. We went on the television station, and at all these centers, the different centers that we do these treatments, there are presentations to those people on these lifestyle diseases. We went on the TV station, a pardon show, and they did this presentation. So it's educating, as well as giving some treatment. The last one we did um, was before the elections, I think it was, in, in West Borbis, the whole of West Borbis. So at different um, centers, we use schools, we use the uh, uh, medical centers, and, and so on, public buildings, to do this. And um, we are now working on a group health insurance, and so maybe um, it might start in, in January. We are members of the force, um, will because we are a big group, um, and by the time we fill that establishment, we will be close to 5,000. So there are a lot of incentives from the company. They want the large group, but they have to give something, so the negotiations went well. And we may start, in, likely to start in January, and then I'll be going to government and say, listen, help us with half the cost, so the rank only pays half. And then it can include family on that health arrangement. We do anticipate that there will be a lot of savings and the company, the insurance company has agreed to pay a benefit whenever any member of the force die while serving. So, we, we introduce an annual um, fitness assessment. So it works like this, based on the age group. You have to do this physical fitness test and if you don't make it, then we have an expert that work with you to build you up. So we have one, a fitter force that will deliver, likely to deliver better services, but at the same time, it keep our ranks healthy. And so there are a number of things that we do on the welfare side. Um, we have changed the way we are doing promotions. It used to be a whole lot of um, what I will call um,
the uh, analysis that wasn't really uh, put to test. So it's a lot of subjective kind of thing, you know. The somebody that run errands sometimes get come up for analysis, and the guy who is fighting crime in the street, nobody recognizes the efforts and so on. So what we have done now is every rank we think that they uh, deserve a promotion, right and state. And there is a promotion board who has to address every one of those applications. You can call them for interview. There is a, um, we are now doing um, work analysis, so performance analysis. So that is in the file, and they measure what they say against what's in the file. And so it becomes more objective and more fair. And it helps to keep people on, you know, I got a chance. We are now working on developing a roadmap. This is where you are, and if you want to get this level, this is the route to take. So they are more informed. We have developed an official personal email for each member of the force. So the information goes not in one place and black at another, but everyone gets the same information. So you keep them informed. So there are a whole lot that we are doing towards recruitment and retention. Uh, capacity building, whole lot of work there as well. We had we targeted initially the criminal investigation department, crime intelligence. Uh, we were preparing for elections in, in uh, 2015, so public order, you know what happened during elections and all the protests that go pretty nasty and so on. So we dealt with public order training, but our strongest strategy going into the election was to go into the communities and work with those people so you know everybody from every community when they come out and protest what you are doing. You know, if you broke up your neighborhood, it's you got to live inside tomorrow. Nobody ain't coming and wheel of one and fix it. And, and those kinds of things. If you break the roads in the community, it's you got to live there. And, and there's a different perspective on what they do. Fortunately, we had only one incident in Sophia during the elections. This, we don't know how, to what extent it helped that, but it puts us in a better position. Um, public trust, as I said, all these things complement each other. Going in, Albaistong, for example. The residents of Albaistong, wherever they see the police, the picture they get, they come start somebody's house, they come lock up somebody, they come abuse the powers, that kind of stuff. Every kid see them, well, it's me, daddy, they carry today. You know, that kind of thing. That, that's what's going on in the mind. That has all changed. That has all changed. They're welcoming the police into the neighborhood. They're calling sometimes publicly. Actually, there was a lot of uh, criticisms to the project when we started. Every day in the press from different circles and so on. That changed within a month. Within a month. Um, you look at the, every day on the front pages, one of the things is that crime and violence sells news. News are in place for profit. They work like every other private sector organization. The bottom line is profit. So I have to sell my newspaper, I have to get ads if I can tell the business sector that people are looking at my news. And people want to know about crime and violence. Even the movies, the um, video games, they're all violence. That's what people like, I don't know, something with our human nature maybe. But the serious crimes that occur again makes the headlines. And when you see one robbery on the newspaper headline, it's only one we had in the country. I mean, a serious robbery. If there is a murder, it makes the headline is only the one we get now. So it's different from the other communities. However, that doesn't provide comfort to us. I mean, making the headlines is a different issue, but the one robbery doesn't make us comfortable. So we don't get hardened to the kinds of emotions that are stored within the community, the type of fear within those communities and so on. So we constantly keep training, developing our skills, acquiring more resources, what we can get from the government through budget, we use that. 
but we also get a lot of support. Nari spoke about a whole lot coming out of New York right here from these gentlemen. Um, Jay, his wife Sylvia, uh, Sarwan, Nareesh himself, a lot. I'm going to speak and show you a slide a little bit more on what their money are doing in Uganda. And from that five minute conversation, how we reach to where we are now. Under um, the well, the strategic plan we start implementing then. So the first year started 2014, and we have completed all the projects in the plan. And the first year was the toughest because it deals with infrastructure. The others are just operational. So once the infrastructure is in place, you can deliver on the operations, and then there is monetary evaluation. You review what you do in a quick period. I'll speak to that a little bit more as well. Um, oh, it's here now. The infrastructure program. We have an IT platform. So every crime reported, every report that the police receive, both crime and traffic, goes into that system. It took us a while before, that started way before 2014. And it took us a while before we get to where we are now. But right now, in each police division, there is a unit called the Divisional Base Management Information Unit that use that information, does analysis, show the commander where the hotspots are, where we have clusters, whether it's assaults, whether it's nuisances, whether it's robberies, breakage, and, and so on. And that commit commander uses the re resources he has to deploy strategically so that we can address the problems and get the biggest um, bang for the buck. Then, a week later, he review that deployment and come back and see whether the numbers are the same, whether they have reduced, whether they've gone up, and try to come with some explanation of what is happening so that that can be addressed. Sometimes it's just changing people, sometimes it's changing numbers, sometimes the whole operation itself is flawed, you can use another strategy. And that is ongoing. With, in terms of uh, accountability, we created an office for uh, audit and inspections. So they target different places and they look at police building government property and how they are cared for. They look at our accounting system and all those kind of things to prevent uh, slippages. Uh, there is also the um, Office of Professional Responsibility that was trained recently by exports from U.S. under the uh, Caribbean Basin Security Initiative. And so we have changed 